Today's scripture is from Acts 22, verses 3 to 16. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I stuttered under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as a high priest and all the council that can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Betsy, for reading our scripture this morning. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time, this moment, when we let your word speak to our hearts individually. I know you have a special word for everybody here, and it may be different, because that's the way your Holy Spirit works. Help us to be open to what you want to say to us. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, you are our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I grew up in Plainview, Texas. I told the uh, men's breakfast guys about this uh, a few weeks ago. But in Plainview, Texas, as I was growing up, there was a, a bank downtown that had a, a digital sign. And it gave the time and the temperature, basically, is all it gave. But it got stuck one time on 1159. It stayed that way for months. I don't know why it took them so long to fix it. But you know what? 1159 is one minute until midnight. And midnight represents for us the end of the day, but it also marks the beginning of the next day. And that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about transitions. This is the third sermon in a four-week series that I'm doing on that. And so, all transitions begin with an ending. Something changes in our life. It could be a positive thing, it could be a negative thing, but we have to adjust to that. And as we've already talked about, the ending is followed by the middle zone, where we are learning to let go of the old, whatever's gone to the past, so we can grab hold of the new. And then finally, we get a new beginning, and we're going to talk about that new beginning next week. But today, once more, I want us to spend some time in the middle zone, because it's so important during transition. And we all need help making transitions in our lives. So we've looked at the transition process the last two weeks in the life of Joseph, the life of Moses in the Old Testament. Today, we want to look at the Apostle Paul. And when you, look, when you think of transitions, perhaps the greatest transition in the Bible is found in the life of a man named Saul, who later became known as Paul, the Apostle Paul. I mean, his transition was so great from what his life had been to what his life would become that he even changed his name to mark the difference in outlook and destiny. And his transition was of such magnitude that you could call it, if you look at his life, a total transformation. 
I mean, some transitions in our lives are that meaningful and that life-changing. So what happened to him was so important that his conversion experience is recounted three times in the book of Acts. Chapters 9, chapter 22, chapter 26. And it's always before some judge. You almost get the idea that every time Paul was dragged before a judge, the judge would be thinking, oh no, the Damascus Road story again. You know? Because Paul always went back to this. So when we read Paul's story, if we're not careful, we will think the change was completely instantaneous. But nothing could be further from the truth. Even in the book of Acts, Paul was not readily accepted by the Christians, his former targets of severe persecution. Because of the way the book of Acts is constructed, we get the idea that Paul was blinded by a great light, had his conversion with the Lord one day, and then the next day he was out preaching the gospel. An ending of one life and an immediate new beginning. But that's not the way it happened. He spent a long time in this middle zone that we talked about last week and we continue to look at today. Because Paul is converted in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. And in chapter 11, it tells us that Barnabas went and sought him out to bring him back to Antioch to help in the church there. So that's just two chapters. That sounds pretty quick. But Paul gives us a bigger picture in the book of Galatians. Listen to what he said. In case you had a mistaken notion of, of his transition, listen to what Paul says there about his transition. The book of Galatians. He said that he wrote this. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by His marvelous grace. Then it, uh, then it pleased Him to reveal His Son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the, to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away into Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter. And I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. I declare before God that what I'm writing to you is not a lie. After that visit, I went north into the provinces of Syria and Cilicia, and still the Christians in the churches in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew was that people were saying, the one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Then, 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem again, this time with Barnabas, and Titus came along too. I mean, did you get that? That's a long passage, but three years later, he says, after his conversion, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter. And still, he said, the Christians in Judea weren't ready to accept him. And 14 years passed before the Council of Jerusalem happened that affirmed Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. He had a long middle zone, a long transition period. Because the middle zone is an experience that everyone encounters eventually, I want to try to explain it to you this morning in a different way so you can see the process at work in your own life, I hope. The middle zone begins with integration and then goes through a cycle of disintegration and finally, reintegration. But remember, this whole transition process is for the purpose of gaining valuable knowledge, gaining spiritual truth to help us continue on our life's journey. So let's look at how Paul began the transition cycle. The first one, as I said, is integration. Now notice this, when we think of integration. Then Paul said, I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, and I persecuted the followers of the way. That's the Christians arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. That was his period of integration. It's when our time of integration is upset, though, that marks the beginning of change. I mean, integration is normally a time when things are fairly status quo in your life. 
And from this text, there's a sense that Paul was very comfortable with his status quo. He knew who he was, and he felt like his life was going the way that he had planned. I mean, you think about it, Paul, he thought he was on the right track. And he thought he was serving God. But he had a lot to learn. So notice this about integration. You can feel integrated, you can feel whole, and be far away from who God wants you to be and from what God wants you to be doing. Paul is a very drastic example of this process. And most people, I don't think, are as blind to the truth as he apparently was. But everyone goes through some sort of transition in a lifetime. In fact, most of us go through many kinds of transitions. And sometimes the change is not caused by our own actions. Sometimes it comes because of circumstances or choices that other people make. And we have to adjust to the consequences of their actions. Things seem one way, but underneath, things are not as they seem. Life may seem peaceful, but it isn't based on reality. It does not matter how the change happens whether it's by our own choices or somebody else's choices or life throwing us a curveball, whatever happens, God is interested in doing the best thing for your personal growth. However you got to where you are, He wants to help you get someplace else. So when God begins to put you on a better path, it often requires that you go through a time of being broken. A time of emptiness and wandering in the proverbial desert. I mean, Paul went to Arabia, a literal desert, for three years. And just like Paul, in our own lives, these changes usually happen to us about the time we think we have life all figured out. Suddenly we hit a speed bump. And we find ourselves in huge transition. Suddenly our lives go from a time of integration into a period of disintegration. Here's what Paul talked about there in the passage in Acts. As I was on the road approaching Damascus about noon, a very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus the Nazarene, the one you are persecuting. The word integration comes from the Latin word integer. You remember that word, integer? You learned it in math. It's the term for whole numbers. It means whole, entire, a complete entity. So disintegration means everything gets blown up. It's not whole anymore. So Saul's life, when he's persecuting the Christians, he has a plan, he has a purpose, which he felt was whole, he felt was complete. It gets completely blown away in one blinding moment. He enters a state of complete disintegration. On the way to Damascus to torment those dreaded Christians, a light fell from heaven knocking him to the ground. And Saul, who had been totally integrated as a Jewish authority to persecute and arrest Christians. Becomes completely blind and disintegrated because of this experience with the light of God. And as if that were not upsetting enough, notice the only instruction God gave him was to go to the city where he would be told what to do. That's it. He didn't know if this blindness would be permanent. He didn't know how long he would have to wait in the city before he got the promised directions. All Paul knew was the next step. Now, not to get trite with the analogy, but certainly all of us remember the story of Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Talk about a middle zone, if you think of that movie. She was trying to get home. And all she knew was just the next step. For her, the next step in transition was to follow the yellow brick road. 
And if you remember the movie scene, and that, that picture depicts it, the yellow brick road starts at a point and goes in a circular direction before heading off to the Emerald City. It starts as an interior journey for Dorothy. The transition must come from the inside out. She had to take a journey to get to where she was going, both on the outside and most importantly, on the inside. So that's just a picture of transition in storytelling, which we can find all over the place. How long do these periods of disintegration last when we're making transitions? How long would Paul be blind? How long would it take for God to do His work in Paul's life before Paul would have a true new beginning? Following our analogy, how long do we have to follow the yellow brick road? And the answer is this. Periods of disintegration last as long as it takes. How long is that? As long as it takes. As long as it takes for God to do what He wants to do in your life. As long as it takes for you to gain the wisdom and understanding from your situation to move on to the next phase of transition. As long as it takes for you to reflect and reconsider options and begin letting God help you put the pieces of your life back together again in a completely new and different way. And like Paul, we can only manage the middle zone one step at a time. God did not lay out for Saul, who became Paul, the entire future plan for his existence. He had no idea. Paul had no idea what a big part he was about to play in promoting the kingdom of God, of preaching the gospel to the known world, of writing half the New Testament. All he knew was that he was blind and waiting for someone to come and tell him the next step. We've mentioned uh, the Wizard of Oz. Actually, as I already said, transitions are written into all of our favorite stories in one way or the other. This will date me, but most of you in this room, that won't be a problem for. Think of Star Trek. I mean, you see the idea of transitions in the voyages of the starship Enterprise. And when we look at that particular story, we wish that periods of disintegration lasted as long as beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? But what we usually get is the yellow brick road with witches and flying monkeys and weird traveling companions. <laughs> because periods of disintegration are so unsettling, we try to rush through the process. Some of our resistance to going into transition comes from our fear of this neutral zone, this feeling of limbo, this feeling of emptiness. And the problem usually is not that we don't want to give up a job or possibly a relationship or that we can't let go of our identity or the reality. Here's the problem. The problem is that before we can find a new something, we must deal with a time that feels like at least nothingness. And that prospect awakens our fear. So how do we handle those fears? First thing we have to do is we need to accept our need for this time in the neutral zone. See, we can fall into two traps. The trap of fast forward and the trap of reverse. So we want to get things through things really fast or we want to go back. We, uh, here's the thing. Opt for the turtle, not the hare. Right? And at the same time, do keep moving. Because the opposite temptation to try to undo the changes, to try to put things back the way they were before the transition started, that is equally damaging to us. 
And then finally, I'm not finally, but secondly, take this opportunity to discover what you really want. See, the neutral zone is meant to be only a temporary state. It is, as they say, a great place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. The periods of disintegration in the transition process are never fun, but they can be extremely meaningful. If we understand the process, disintegration can be the greatest growing time in our lives. In disintegration, the power of God has the chance to speak to our heart, to reshape and to remold our lives. Which leads us to another thought. Think about this in terms of the Apostle Paul, but it's so true for us. Being broken in the light of God is much better than feeling whole any place else. Paul felt whole before the Damascus Road experience, but he really wasn't. And now he was in a much better place. Blind, needy, questioning, wondering what God was going to do next. God had him right where he wanted him. And then finally, we get a picture of the beginning of the last phase, which I told you we will talk about much more next week. But reintegration. Here's what Paul said when he's given his testimony. A man named Ananias lived there. He was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law, and well regarded by all the Jews of Damascus. He came and stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And that very moment I could see him. Then he told me, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know His will and to see the righteous one and to hear and speak, for you are to be His witnesses, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. As we've pointed out, this was only the beginning of Paul's reintegration. But at least he knew where he was heading. When disintegration is followed by the reorganization of a person's life, the process is called reintegration. Paul was reintegrated to a better and a more fulfilling future. And so we will discuss that final phase, a new beginning, in greater detail next week. But for now, remember this. Do not fear change. It's coming. We all go through change. Transition is a time to refuel for the journey in that middle zone. and Make the best of it. Let God teach you what He wants to teach you. Ask Him to teach you what He wants to teach you. And then ask God for direction and guidance. And just as He did with Paul, so He will do with you, even without the blinding light. Let's pray. Father, transitions are not an easy time, not a time we look forward to, especially that middle zone like we're talking about. And yet look how, what that meant for the Apostle Paul. How useful he was to you. How purposeful his life became. How, how you bestowed such wonderful gifts on his life to be able to give uh, diligently in the cause of the Gospel. And so, Lord, help us to think of our transition times that same way. Not just help me get my life better so I feel better about myself, but Lord, what are you trying to teach me in the midst of all of this so you can use me for your purpose? So you can bring me to a better place so that I can give my life in service to you. Thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. And we just love you and thank you so much for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our uh, closing song we'll sing in just a minute.